Welcome back. In this video, I want to cover the mixer, which is another of the main components of FL Studio. Now, a traditional hardware mixer is what is used to control the individual parameters of different tracks or instruments. These parameters usually include volume and panning, as well as mute and solo functions, and sometimes effects and EQ. The purpose of a mixer is to bring together all of your elements into a smoothly blended and evened out final mix. FL Studio's mixer is designed to offer the same functionality as a hardware mixer, but in a digital form. To bring up the mixer, you can either select it from the shortcut toolbar or press F9. As you can see, we have different mixer tracks represented by the different strips. Each strip contains your level meter, your volume fader, your pan pot, your mute solo switch, as well as routing options, an effect switch indicator, and some disc recording options. To select a mixer track strip, you can simply left click on it and it will become highlighted. In the default view, we can only see mixer tracks 1 through 15, so to view the other tracks, we can use the scroll bar at the top of the mixer or scroll up and down with the mouse wheel while on the mixer. We also see that we have a master track which doesn't move and four send tracks and a selected track. Each mixer track also gives us a three band EQ, stereo separation knob, delay compensation, as well as an in and out selector. We'll cover all of this in a bit more detail as we move along. So, to begin using the mixer, we need to assign channels to the various mixer tracks. To do this, we need to click on a channel to bring up its channel settings window. In the top right hand corner of this window, you'll notice a display that's labeled effects. You can left click and drag up or down to select a mixer track to send this channel to. So for this example, we'll set this channel to mixer track number one. Now, this channel is feeding into mixer track number one. This means if we adjust any settings on the number one mixer track, it will affect this audio. This way, we can apply effects to individual channels, more carefully adjust volume and panning, as well as use the built-in EQ. Now, this is not to say that you can't mix your project using the channel volume and panning, but again, you won't have as much control, and you won't be able to use effects such as compression, delay, or reverb. So when we press play, you can see that the level meter shows our output for this channel. To solo, we can right click the solo switch and all other switches will mute. You can also hold down the alt key and left click to solo a track. To add additional solo tracks, you can then left click on any other tracks that you want playing at the time. To unmute all, we can just right click again twice. While all tracks are active, we can mute tracks by left clicking the tracks that we want muted. To unmute, just left click again. The volume fader is represented by this slider here. We can left click and drag to bring it up or down. As I mentioned in the channel window tutorial, this is your output. The mixer tracks all feed into the master mixer track, which leads to your final output. The channel volume is your input signal. The reason you need to be able to separate these is because the input signal may need to be raised or lowered to affect something, but the output needs to stay the same. Let me give you an example to clear this up. A compressor requires that the volume reach a certain point in order for it to begin working. This is called the threshold. So if we insert a compressor into our first mixer track and we have a sample feeding into it, we need to make sure that our input signal coming from the channel itself is at the right volume. Once it is, we can then turn down the compressed signal. If we try to adjust the volume from the channel itself, it's going to affect how the compressor works and we might not get the sound we want, or the sound might keep changing. Think about digital audio processing like a chain. The first link in the chain is the input signal. This is the original sound coming into the program. The next link in the chain is the channel. This is where we can adjust some volume and panning, as well as some effects and edits. Next, the channel feeds into the mixer track. Here, we can adjust the track volume, panning, effects, etc. Next, the mixer track feeds into the master mixer track. This is where all of your mixer tracks come together. The master mixer track is then sent to your main stereo output. We'll take a look at setting this up in a second. 
So remember that when you are adjusting volume in FL Studio, you're dealing with a number of factors. The channel volume, the mixer track volume, and then the monitor volume. Some plugins also have their own internal volume. The key to working with all of this is to balance your volume going into the mixer. Let the mixer be your final volume. The volume fader at the top of the file menu panel serves as your master volume for the entire project. The mixer feeds into it as your final output stage. So now that we've covered the basics, I want to quickly cover the EQ section. As mentioned, each mixer track has its own EQ. We have three separate bands, and below each band, we have controls for bandwidth, or Q, and frequency. You can also left-click on the graphical display to move the bands around. The sliders can also be used to determine the level of each filter. This is a great way to make quick changes to the track's equalization without having to insert a VST effect. We also have our panning knob and our stereo separation. You can always return to the default position by right-clicking and selecting Reset. The stereo separation is also a great way to widen your track. Without going into too much detail, stereo separation makes the sound wider by separating the signal in the left and right speakers. In a normal stereo field, each monitor or speaker is receiving sound. By separating the stereo field, it's like hard panning each stereo channel hard left and hard right, so there is no blending in the center. This creates a psychoacoustic illusion to your brain that makes the sound wider. You can turn this knob to the right to form a mono sound, or to the left to form a widened sound. When using the right position, keep in mind that the signal will not actually be mono, it's just that the sound will be balanced, or summed, to both speakers, meaning each speaker is putting out the exact same signal, creating, again, an illusion in your mind that makes it sound like a single channel. FL Studio does not output mono files, so when exporting, even if you have the stereo separation knob all the way to the right, you will still end up with the stereo file. Also, note that FL Studio can import and work with mono files, but the stereo separation will have no effect on them, as there is only one audio channel and nothing to widen. My suggestion is to use this feature sparingly. I try to use it only on my master track, usually separating at about 25-30%. to 30%. I will, however, use the stereo separation knob on bass sounds to bring them to the center. Do this by turning the knob all the way to the right to create the mono sound. This keeps bass sound centered and then if you need to, you could pan them. Many times, things like deep pad sounds will have a wide stereo image, so summing them together with the stereo separation knob turned all the way to the right can keep it from overtaking your panning ability. Also, the panning and volume controls to the right of the EQ area are the same controls that are on the mixer track strip. Any changes made in either area will be the same. You'll notice as you move them around, the controls change on the strip as well. Another way to use them is to left click on the graph display and drag around to get your panning and volume moving at once. The delay compensation setting allows you to either choose a pre or post setting for delay compensation. This is a useful tool if you're recording from hardware. We also have options for in and out. This is where we choose our hardware devices. For instance, if I have a mixer or microphone plugged into my computer and FL Studio recognizes it, we can select it from the input device section. The output is the same way. If we have a mixer with different channels, you can left click the output section and select the appropriate output. This works with the ASIO devices only, so if you're not using an ASIO enabled device, the input section will be blanked out. You can select different inputs and outputs for different channels as well as use things like rewire from other programs to direct sound to specific channels in that program. Another thing to note is the selected channel. This is a new feature in FL Studio 8 and works like this. Whatever mixer track you have highlighted is considered the selected channel. Nothing changes, you don't have to do anything, it's automatically selected. This is beneficial because it works like an audition track. The most common use for this is to put a meter or the new Wave Candy plugin on the selected channel, and then you can select different mixer tracks to see them through the plugin without having to put it on each mixer track. 
For example, if I have a kick drum on mixer track 1 and a snare on mixer track 2, and I wanted to look at each one of them individually through an oscilloscope, it used to be I would have to put a scope plug in on each mixer track and then bring each one up individually. Now, I just put the scope plug in on the selected channel and I can highlight the individual tracks one at a time to see each one through the scope plugin. You can also use this to audition effects. Say you wanted to see how different samples would sound through a particular reverb setting. You could put the reverb on the selected track, make sure you assign your samples to their own mixer tracks, and then while playing back, you could highlight those different mixer tracks to hear the effect on the selected track. Also notice that if we have the selected channel highlighted, the effects on it affect the entire project, as if affecting the master channel. We're going to cover routing in another tutorial, so I won't go over the routing options or the send tracks, but I do want to cover the disc recording options at the bottom of each strip. This is FL Studio's version of a freeze function. Freezing basically means rendering a track and then reinserting it so that it still plays along with your project, but you can't make any edits to it. The benefit to this is that you can remove the data or plugins when you're done and then save CPU while keeping the same sound. For example, let's say you're adding VST instruments to your project and it starts to slow down and get glitchy. What you could do is find the instruments that are using the most resources and then use the disk record function to export those tracks. Once you're done exporting, FL Studio will automatically re-import the tracks that you just rendered as audio clips and insert them into the timeline. Then you can either delete or mute the original instruments. Remember, if you erase a channel, you cannot undo it, so before you delete a channel, always remember to save your project. So to do this, we would need to decide which mixer track or tracks contain the data we want exported. You can assign any number of channels to a single mixer track, so make sure you know what's going to what, or else you may end up with more than what you wanted. So let's say that you have all your pad instruments on mixer track number one. Then you need to left click on the little disc icon at the bottom of that mixer track. A dialog screen will pop up asking you what you want to name the file and where you want to save it. You can do this for any of the mixer tracks you have and you will need to name each file. The disc icon will light up indicating that that particular track is going to be exported. Then, you can left click the arrow icon at the top left hand corner of the mixer and select disc recording. Then select render to wave. You'll have another dialog appear giving you export options such as interpolation method and bitrate. Once you press render, the process will begin and when it finishes, you should have your rendered files inserted in the playlist as audio clips. Now, this only works in song mode. In pattern mode, your audio will be rendered but not reinserted. You can also enable or disable this option by checking it in the disc recording menu. The auto unarm option will automatically unarm any tracks slated for recording once recording has finished. We'll discuss recording a bit more in detail later. We also have options for latency compensation and 32-bit float recording. We also have some options under the view item to either hide or show the level meter, as well as change the positioning of the tracks. Detached, once again, allows the mixer to be moved outside of the screen for multi-screen setups. The file item lets us open any saved mixer setups, complete with whatever plugins or settings they were saved with. The open audio editor and logger will open the Edison editor in either an editing state or a recording state. We'll talk more about Edison as well later. Below that, we have some linking options, as well as options to rename or set an icon for the currently selected mixer track. These same functions can be reached by right-clicking on a mixer track. The icon option simply inserts the graphic of your choice at the top of the mixer track. This is a neat way to label your track so that you can remember what's what. I would also suggest using the rename function to rename your tracks in order to keep up with them. Finally, we have options for Move Left and Move Right, which allows you to shift your settings to the next mixer track. This will also change the mixer assignments you made using the Channel Settings window. So as we've seen, the mixer is a very powerful piece of FL Studio and will turn out to be the heart of your project. Improper use of the mixer can turn a great project into a terrible one, but proper use of the mixer can turn a mediocre project into a killer one. 
It's beyond the scope of this video to really discuss mixing, but the ultimate goal of a mix, and by proxy the mixer, is to achieve a well-balanced overall sound, including panning and volume, as well as effects and EQ. Again, the rule of less is more applies to mixing. As you use the program, and if you're new to digital audio in general, it may be tempting to pile on plugins and effects and really try to manipulate the sound. But as you'll find in moving along, the less you manipulate something, the more powerful the sound, because the effects will not be as noticeable and the project will sound more natural. I want to thank you again for watching, and I hope that I've been able to share some insight into the mixer and its use, and in the next video, we'll discuss different approaches to workflow and how to get your project started. Thanks again for watching.